glad to see you this morning. Glad to see those that are here in person. Those that are joining us online, I can't see you, but I'm glad you can see us. And I'm glad you're worshiping with us today. So if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the, for the beauty of you and the goodness of you. As we come before you, uh, Lord, worshiping our hope and desires that we would make much of you in every way, shape, and form that we can. Lord, let, uh, let our worship, I pray, be found to be true. Let it be found uh, to be honoring and glorifying to you. Our eyes focused upon you. Lord, for our country and our nation, we pray right now. Lord, for the number of things that are taking place, uh, the division, the heartache, the anger, the frustrations, the number of things that we see facing, uh, facing us right now. God, we pray for our leaders. We pray for those that are having to make very difficult decisions. Uh, Lord, we ask that you, would, that you would move in this country as only you can, that you would stir the hearts of your believers, Father, as only you can, and that you would open our eyes to be able to, uh, to see where you are moving and how to have uh, the perspective that you have, Lord, uh, with all that's taking place. So, Lord, let us worship you and love you today. Let us fellowship well. Let us sing well. Uh, Father, regardless whether we can hold another, we can't. Let us sing as loud as we can, Lord, because you are the King of kings and you are worth every single note, Lord. You are worth our whole praise and our whole heart. Thank you for the chance to worship you today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen.
25, 21 says, For our sake, God the Father made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we might become the righteousness of God. Please stand. <laughs>
It's the water of life. It's you are the bread of life, Father. Everything that we need, the sustenance that we need comes from you and your word. So as we study your word this morning, Father, I pray that it would be your truth that we crave and not our validation of truth. That it would be your truth that we crave and not our own version of truth. Father, speak as only you can in this time. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> First, I want to apologize for the uh, tech glitch we had earlier. Computer does what computer does. And uh, you just have to do with what it's going to do. I want to say con- uh, some praise to uh, Zach and Jesse uh, for getting it back up online. Uh, they had to reboot the thing twice just to be able to get it going. So thank you guys. Well done. Way to stay, uh... Way to stay calm and when everybody's standing up there waiting for words. So... Uh, Today is part five. Today is part five of our Acts series, our book of Acts series that details the birth of the church, the spread of the gospel to the outer ends of the earth. And we're going to get right to scripture. We're going to be looking at Acts chapter four and chapter five today, but we're going to be reading Acts chapter four, verse 13 through 22 to start with. But while you're turning there, understand that what we're about to read picks up, picks up with where we left off with last week. Acts chapter two, Acts chapter three. Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5, they all kind of blend together like we talked about last week. Acts chapter 2 the details the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit falling onto the church, the, the gospel being proclaimed. Uh, it said that the church began to form, that people began to form, that they began, started to come and gather together, that, that 3,000 people came to faith in Christ, that they start gathering in homes and every day in the temple. And it says, and every day that wonders were being performed by the apostles. So Acts chapter 3 gives us a glimpse, like we talked about last week, a glimpse of one of those wonders that was being done, and it was being done in the temple, right? So Peter and John enter. There's a man who's been crippled from birth, and he's been crippled from birth, and is, uh, he sees John and Peter asks for money, and Peter and John say, how about you walk instead, right? I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, and we're jumping to it. But he says, why don't you walk? And so he reaches down, helps the man up. The man not only walks, but he runs, he dances. He starts praising God all the way into the temple. The message starts being proclaimed and preached all throughout the the temple. People are are running, literally running and flocking to this man and to Peter and John, wanting to know what in the world is happening. And they preach the gospel. People are listening. People are coming to faith in Christ. But not only are, are random people through the temple listening, but so too are the religious leaders, and they're not happy. And that's what brings us into chapter 4. The religious leaders actually hear the message being preached. They become angry, and they arrest the apostles. They arrest the apostles, and that's where we're going to pick up. The apostles have been arrested, and this is what we're about to read takes place at their first trial. So verse 13, it says that, that when they observe, they being the religious, religious leaders, that when they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in opposition. After they ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves and said, well, what should we do with these men? For an obvious sign has been done through them. It's clear to everyone living in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so this does not spread any further among the people. Let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For this sign of healing had been performed on a man of over 40 years old. One of the reasons I like preaching through whole books of the Bible is it inevitably is going to bring you face to face with real issues that were issues not only then, but there are also issues today. And one of those issues then, as well as today, is the work and the advancement of the gospel 
in and through a tumultuous season. In, in particular, a very politically hostile climate. And the gospel is trying to advance and comes face to face with the institution of government. And how is it going to continue to proceed? So that's right. We're going to talk about politics today. <laughs> One of my favorite Halloween specials of all time is uh, It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. And uh, in it, Linus has a very profound statement. He says, there are three things that I've learned never to discuss with people. Religion, politics, and the Great Pumpkin. <laughs> As Christians, we don't have the luxury of not being able to talk about politics. We don't have that luxury. Not only should we talk about politics, but we are called to engage our political world because we have to remember that God is not just the God of sanctuaries, private lives, and private thoughts. He's also the God of public discourse. He's also the God of public conversation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, it tells us that we are Christ's ambassadors. We are his representatives, that we speak on his behalf. How powerful is that? How crazy is that? Think about that, that when you become a believer, instantly you also become an ambassador. Talk about a promotion, right? And you are tasked with representing the king of kings, just like the U.S. has ambassadors to different nations, that when our ambassadors go to these different nations and these different leaders and they speak, they speak with the full authority of the United States behind them. When they speak, it's as if the president of the United States is speaking to them. And in the same way, when believers speak as ambassadors of Christ, we carry the full weight of eternity with us. That the message we, we proclaim is not ours, but it's God's. We represent an eternal nation, and we are citizens of an eternal king. It is his kingdom. And when we speak on his behalf, we speak on his behalf on two fronts. Number one, like 1 Corinthians 5.20 says, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20, it says that we plead with people in the world who are far from God. We plead with them to please come back to him. Come back to God. The second way we plead with people is the best we can, we communicate the truth of who God is in a way that reflects God's character. We reflect God's character in the way that we communicate the biblical truth of who he is. So let me put this another way. We speak about God's new kingdom, his new kingdom ethic with new kingdom character. We speak about God's new kingdom, his new kingdom ethic, and we do so hopefully with a new kingdom character. That is our calling it's not an easy one. And it becomes even harder when you live in a very polarized and a very tribal culture politically. It becomes very difficult to have these conversations. But that's the reality that we live in. And right now we have very loud voices screaming. They tend to be on the extreme sides of both sides. This side is yelling and this side is yelling. And what happens is both sides are yelling, screaming, accusing, mocking, belittling, threatening the other side so loudly that it seems like there's very little room for a reasonable voice to be heard. That there's no room for discourse anymore. There's no room for conversation anymore. And so the voices that feel reasonable, they feel like they have a reasonable voice or they have honest questions. They feel silenced or threatened into submission. Matter of fact, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, they, uh, they recently wrote an article that quoted a study that was done by the Cato Institute. And it found that right now, 62% of Americans, 62% of Americans do not feel like they're free to share their thoughts or feelings because of how dramatically polarized our culture is. And then they did a study across political lines, and that was across the board. 52% of Democrats said they didn't feel safe to share their thoughts. 59% of independents said they didn't feel free to share their thoughts. 77% of Republicans said they didn't feel safe to be able to share their opinions, their thoughts, or their feelings because of fear of offending somebody or then being silenced or marginalized or misunderstood. This isn't a new story, though. The apostles faced a very similar climate. The events of Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 are just like this. They're just like this. But what's happening is the religious leaders, who are the powers to be, the religious leaders are framing Acts chapter 4 and chapter 5 as if it's a, a conversation about worship. 
That's how it's being framed. But the reality is it's about power and status using God's name. It's a political conversation and the world was watching it play out. At that time, it was a one party system. You had the religious leaders who you might call the original moral majority, right? You have the, you have the, the original moral majority. You have the religious leaders and everyone else. Note that the religious leaders, if you look at chapter 4, verse 5, you read 4, verse 5, and you notice that these names sound kind of familiar. They sound kind of familiar. Like, where have I heard these names before? And then you realize Caiaphas, Ananias. Where have I heard these names? You flip back into the Gospels to Jesus' trials. These are the same leaders that put Jesus on trial. Matter of fact, at Easter, we talked about the six trials that Jesus faced. Even in quarantine, we, we talked about as Easter was approaching, Jesus faced six different trials. And, and, and Ananias and Caiaphas were two of the primary leaders leading that. Well, guess whose names are mentioned in chapter four of Acts? Ananias and Caiaphas, the same leaders. These religious leaders, the Sanhedrin, you can pretty much say that they're both the church and the state. They live under Roman rule, but the Romans pretty much left them to their own unless it started to threaten the Roman Empire or they needed to have something done that was above their their parameters, such as when they needed Jesus to be executed. The Jewish leaders didn't have permission to do that, so they had to go to Roman rule to get permission to do that. So they asked the Romans, can you kill this guy for us? They said, yeah, why not? Right. And so even though they're under Roman rule, they're pretty much left to do whatever they want to do. And so the Jewish leaders are both the church and the state and the apostles, as they're beginning to share the gospel, the church is beginning to grow. It grows to 3000 to 5000. We see that last week. We talked about that last week. It grows to 5000 and it's still growing and still counting. The apostles, the, uh, the religious leaders are watching it happen and they feel threatened just like they did under Jesus. They felt threatened. They felt threatened in their religious rule, which also means that they felt threatened in their political power. So what do they do when they feel threatened politically? They silence the voices. They silence the voices. They hung Jesus on a cross, hoping that would take care of it. The problem is it didn't. Then as believers start preaching the exact same message, and they now face the wrath of the religious leaders. But they have the same approach that Christ did. In verse 17 through 20, we're going to reread it. We just read it a little bit ago, but I'm going to reread just this little section right here. Verse 17 through 20, on trial, the apostles, it says this. Verse 17 says, the religious leaders said, so that this doesn't spread any further. Right? So this doesn't spread any further. So this gospel doesn't spread any further. This truth doesn't spread any further. So this news doesn't spread any further. What are we going to do? Let's threaten them. Let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in his name again. So they called the apostles back and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. The state starts to threaten the voices. Peter and John rightly answer them, wanting to honor and respect the government. They're not trying to disrespect or dishonor their rulers, but they also understand that there's, a, and there's an authority that rests higher. And they say this, Peter and John answered them, it says that whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. But for us, we're unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. We're unable to stop speaking about what we've seen and what we've heard. Understand, this is a powerful statement. God, man. We have to listen to God above man. This is a powerful, powerful statement. Matter of fact, it ought to be a sobering reminder to us that there is a kingdom that reigns higher than the kingdom of men. It ought to be a sobering reminder that there is a flag that waves higher than the flag of any other nation. It ought to be a sobering reminder that there's an economy that actually measures eternity. That there is a king that holds power above every other president, emperor, king, dictator, or elected official. And when the apostles state what they state, that we have to honor God above man, understand something. This is a statement of allegiance to a different nation. That we're with him. And we have to speak on his behalf. It's a powerful statement that's been used by Christians that are facing unjust persecution throughout history. 
Christians who've been arrested also, who've been beaten to within an inch of their life, and even Christians who are facing death, reciting this verse to themselves and to their captors, who are telling them, we'll let you go if you just recant your faith. And they said, we cannot recant our faith. We cannot recant our faith because we have got to listen to our God over your rule. Because there's only one true God and you're not him. And there have been countless Christians that have lost their lives with that verse in their mouth. But as powerful as that verse is, it's also a very dangerous one when we use it out of context. It's a very dangerous one. And it's been used by Christians uh, throughout history to justify personal agendas as if God supports their personal agenda. It's been used countlessly to justify ungodly political behavior and responses in God's name. Throughout history, there have been times we've, we've seen popes in church history that were so corrupt that they were trying to lord over, lord over medieval governments to get their way. And they would use this verse as the justification for why they should be able to beat the government into submission. Christians acting as oppressors uh, over other nations using this verse. There have been some Christians who have used this verse to justify slavery. There have been Christians who have used this verse to justify returning violence for violence. And in Acts chapter 4 and 5, the religious leaders, they imprisoned Peter and John, not once, but twice. They didn't get the message the first time. The, God, the, the apostle said, we're not going to stop preaching this. So they go back and they start preaching it. And what happens? They get arrested again and they're brought back in for another trial. Because what happens is the religious leaders are using their faith and their position of power to act unjustly. First they did it toward Christ and now they're doing it toward the apostles. But what ends up happening is a stark difference of response. The way the apostles and the way that Christ responds to the oppressors is far different than the oppressors toward those that are being oppressed. And the people are watching and listening. Because what ends up happening is the apostles, while they're being oppressed by the government, they do something radical and crazy. They love the oppressors. They share the gospel with them and they offer freedom to their oppressors through the name of Jesus. The one that they're persecuting and the one they've already persecuted and hung on a cross in his name. Freedom is available even to you, even though you hung them on a cross. They offered the religious leaders the same freedom that they themselves once found in Christ when they were far from God. In chapter 5, we're going to fast forward. Chapter 5, verse 29 through 32. This is their second trial. This is their second trial. Peter and the apostle. Peter and the apostles are standing before the leaders. And it says in verse 29, it says, Peter and the apostles replied again. We must obey God rather than people. The God of our ancestors, our ancestors. You do remember that we're all Jewish together, right? You do all remember that we have the same history, right? You do all remember that the same Messiah you were waiting for has already come. We know because we saw him come and we walked with him. That's what we're telling everybody is that we saw it and you're missing it. Our ancestors have the same God and that God raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree across man. Talk about gutsy. Verse 31, God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior. Hold on to those two, okay? Ruler and savior, hold on to those. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They share the gospel with their oppressors. They tell their oppressors the same freedom that they received is available to them if they do two things. Number one, verse 31, it says that if they realize that Jesus is both Savior and ruler, you think you're in charge, but have you forgot the Old Testament where the government was founded by God and that power and authority comes from him? That there is a king that gives kings power. Your rule comes from him. And there is a chief ruler, and his name is Jesus. He is Savior and Lord. Savior and ruler. And like I said last week, there are a number of people who have no problem accepting Christ as Savior, but there are a ton of people who have trouble accepting him as Lord. 
No problem with the Savior, but a ton of problems with the Lord because they'd rather tell God how to be God rather than submit to him as God. And so they tell him, if you accept Christ, you recognize him as supreme ruler over you, verse 31, and also you repent of your sin, both, both as men and also as abusive leaders, then there is forgiveness and new life. And there's a whole crowd listening, by the way, and he turns to the crowd and he looks at the crowd and he says, and this gift is for all of Israel. He's not going to waste the moment. He said, this is for you leaders, but it's also for you guys, you in the cheap seats. This is for you. You guys over here, this is for you because this gospel is for all people. You want to know what the real gospel looks like? It looks like liberty and justice for all. That is the gospel. It's life. The real gospel offers new life to both the oppressors and the oppressed. It offers dignity for the marginalized, empowerment for the weak, wholeness for the broken, a voice for the voiceless, eternal life for repentant spiritual traitors. I don't know any other kingdom that has that kind of economy. I don't know any other kingdom that has that kind of rule. That is the vision and the platform of the kingdom of God. If you want to know what the political platform of the kingdom of God, I just gave it to you. It's that. And when we add, does the gospel that we say we represent offer those very same things to people, even those people who believe differently than you, even those people who have different political values than you, even those people who are going to vote a different ticket than you, do we offer that same hope? Because I wonder how many Christians today instead in this political climate are taking the way of the religious leaders. And the tool that they're using is not the gospel, but it's taking a play from the playbook of the religious leaders. And their goal is to silence anybody that believes differently than them. And just like the religious leaders, they want to silence, berate, belittle, smear, mock and marginalize their critics and opponents. That Christians, instead of offering freedom to oppressors, are instead trying to get them locked up in bondage. That instead of loving enemies, they've forgotten what that, that gospel looks like. They think that it meant somebody else. But that the gospel to love your enemy doesn't apply to them. So instead, they hate their enemy and they hate people. And they, or at least they demonstrate that type of level of, of, of care and sincerity. Right? If, if the way that we love some of our neighbors, right, if that's love, then I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with it. But that's what we're seeing in this political climate. And that's why people are starting to wonder what's happening with Christians. Because they see Christians standing for righteousness in all the wrong ways. How we engage the world politically matters. How we listen to God versus man, it matters. Come this November, hear me on this. Come this November, it is possible for your candidate to win and your Christian witness to lose. It is possible for your political party to win and your Christian witness to lose. How we engage the public square matters. We are called to be bold witnesses for Christ, not quiet ones. We are called to be loving witnesses for Christ. We are called to engage and to be ambassadors in all spheres of life. So how do we do that? Well, I've got seven. Some we're going to go through quickly. Some will hang on a little bit. Seven ways we can engage the public sphere biblically. Number one, remember, we are all Christ's ambassadors. We are all Christ's ambassadors. As a Christian, remember, you bear his name. He doesn't bear yours. You bear his name. The apostles were very mindful of that, and they shared that reality publicly, whether they were on trial, whether they were in jail, or even in their suffering. And they did suffer because they ended up being beaten because of their faith and because their unwillingness to stop preaching the gospel. They remembered who they represented. When you speak, remember whose name you bear. And for those that choose to sit silently, remember whose name you're leaving out of the public sphere. And out of the public square. Number two, keep things in perspective. How do we engage this this world, this public square? Keep it in perspective. How about eternal perspective? 
Remember that God's eternal kingdom is not hanging in the balance with this election. It didn't hang in the balance with the last one or the one before, the one before, the one before that. And it's not going to hang in the balance with the next one or the one after, the one after. Every election cycle, the media says the same thing and people start getting the same fears that the whole world is going to hell. If eternity hangs in the balance of the United States elections, eternity is probably not what the Bible says it is. If eternity hangs in the balance of which candidate ends up in office, then God's probably not the God that the Bible says he is. We have to keep things in eternal perspective. Remember, the gospel spread in a very threatening environment. Jerusalem was not a warm, welcoming environment for the gospel to spread. The rest of the world was not ready saying, well, Jerusalem doesn't want you. Come on over here. We'll hear your gospel. Nobody wanted it. And it continued to spread. It didn't thwart the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, even under oppression, the kingdom of God reigned supreme. And the gospel went and went and went and traveled and traveled and traveled. Keep things in perspective. Number three, pray for your political leaders and also their opponents. Don't just pray for the people you like or the ones you're voting for. And don't just pray against the ones you hope don't get office. Pray for the political leaders. When's the last time you prayed for President Trump and Melania's marriage? Or Joe Biden and Jill Biden's marriage. When's the last time you prayed for their children or their grandchildren? When's the last time we prayed for God's presence to reign in their life in such a real way that the rest of the world hears the truth of who Jesus is because of their story? See, something happens when we pray for candidates. Matter of fact, something happens when we pray for people. You start to remember that they were made in the image of God. You start to remember that they're actually special and valuable even to God. And we forget that sometimes in our election cycles. Number four. Number four, prioritize the essentialness of worship. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Corporate worship is essential, period. Now that we've got that on the table, so too is personal worship. Don't just talk about church being essential. Live like it is. I wonder how many people are out there mad and yelling about the church needing to be essential, but struggle showing up when the doors are open. They struggle to give. They struggle to serve. They struggle to use their gifts and talents to advance the kingdom of God. The church and personal worship is not a political talking point. The church is not a political talking point. It is a body of believers who are made new in Christ, empowered by the Spirit to love God and to love their neighbors deeply. That is the essential church. Worship is our priority. It is not our platform. The question is, how are we prioritizing it in our lives, though? Is it a priority in our private lives as much as it is our public stances? Is it a priority in the walls and outside the walls? Number five, advance gospel priorities. Advance gospel priorities. Someone once said that being well-informed and being well-versed in your party or ideological talking points are two different things. Being well-versed versus well-informed. Two different things. Understand something. We want to believe the best in people, but you need to understand that not, there's no political party that's getting every platform right. None. And as Christians, we can and we should speak more to the values of the gospel than the ideals of a party. We have got to speak more to the values of the gospel than the ideals of a party. That has to be our drive. That has to be our motivation. 
If certain things are important to God, then they have to be important to us, even if they're not important within our own party. We can't select which parts of God's gospel we like and which parts we don't. We can't select which things are important to God that we want to honor and which ones we don't. The gospel is either all important or all not. And so we have got to prioritize the things that God prioritizes, things like marriage and the nuclear family, because that was God's first institution. Even before government, there was was the family. The right to life. Womb to tomb, we talk about it all the time. But we're not just talking about unborn babies. We're talking about the mothers too. Also conversations that become more divisive, like immigration. Remembering that those are image bearers. They're image bearers. It's not a political talking point, but how do we have the conversation about the people? The right to life is more than just an abortion conversation or a pro-life conversation, but it's talking about the care of the elderly and the needs of people. Gospel priorities talk about justice and human dignity. Conversations about racism should matter to the church because they matter to God. And just because you may not see it, it may not be much of an issue, we have to, in your world, you have to understand that there are people right now that actually have the problem. We've got to listen. Racism, abuse, human trafficking, all of these issues matter to God. Therefore, they ought to matter to us. Matter of fact, dignity was something we even talked about last week. When Peter and John are walking into the temple and they see the man and his body is broken and it's not working, they bring healing to his body. But do you know what they restore first? Do you remember? They restored his dignity. The first thing they say is, look at us. We see you. Everybody else passes by, but we see you. They restored to the man his dignity. And then they restored his body because dignity matters because people, all people are created in the image of God. They're image bearers. And the other thing that matters is free worship, free speech and free assembly. That's not how God frames it. Worship matters to God. But in the U.S., we have provisions to protect that and to make that possible in this country. And they're called free worship, free speech and free assembly. And that matters for all people, not just Christians. We, saw, we see what happens when, in, in nations when you favor one belief system over another is they start to become abusive. Christians have done it in their history and others have done it toward Christians in their history. In our nation, what makes it beautiful is this beautiful melting pot with freedom of speech and religious freedom, giving all faiths a free market for ideas and worship. Even faiths that we may not like or understand, we have the ability to worship freely. And it also gives us the ability to have conversations about who Jesus is and invite them to the kingdom of heaven. You take that away, depending on who's in power, you may not have that conversation. So the ability to worship is something that God gave us. Every person breathing worships something. The question is who and what? I don't know about you, but I want to be able to keep telling people about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So these things ought to become priority for us. Number six, be a student, not just a critic. Be a student, not just a critic. The best students listen My dad used to tell me all the time, it's hard for you to listen if you're too busy talking, son. It's hard for you to listen if you're too busy talking. We have a lot of Christians that are really busy talking, telling other people about their experiences in the world, and too few listening. We've got to become better listeners. We've got to become better listeners. Matter of fact, this very thing takes place in Acts chapter 5, something really profound. It's easy to miss. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's a, there's a religious leader by the name of uh, Gamaliel. He's one of the religious leaders. He's one of the members of the Sanhedrin. He's sitting right alongside of, uh, of Caiaphas and Ananias and all the others. But he does something profound in chapter 5. He wants to honor God. So he advises the other leaders to stop and listen. He advises them to stop and listen. Look at chapter 5, verse 35 
38 through 39. Chapter 5, verses 35, 38 through 39, it says this. It says that Gamaliel said, men of Israel, be careful about what you're about to do to these men. In this present case, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or work is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you are not going to be able to overthrow them. And you might even be found fighting against God. And it says that they were persuaded by him. They listened. They were persuaded by him. How powerful is that statement? You might even be found to be fighting against God. I wonder how many of us with sincere hearts might be found to be fighting against God. Gamaliel, he observes what's going on. Remember what we said at the beginning, we have two sides that are just so busy yelling. Gamaliel, in the middle of the commotion, he stops and he observes. He listens. And then he gave space for God to do God things. He gave space for God to do God things. Remember this. Christians have not always landed on the right side of history and the right side of truth. That should be a very sobering reminder for us that if some of our heroes of the faith didn't get it right every time, we're not going to either. We're not going to either. So we have got to learn how to observe and listen. We've got to learn how to listen to the experiences and stories of others. And we've got to learn to listen to God's leading, how we might be able to love him with our whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love our neighbors well. Listening to God and how to do that. Number seven, the last one. We were talking about keeping gospel priorities. Number seven is we've got to keep the gospel priority. Both Peter and John say they have to obey God rather than people. But when they say it, their goal is simple. It's not to be a rebellious force. It's not trying to rile up other believers. It's not trying to turn the city upside down. They're not trying to turn the city into chaos because they know that God is a God of order. Instead, they're just stating a very simple truth. That God is really God and they can't stop telling the world about him. That they want to keep loving God and keep loving their neighbors, doing good for other people, just like they did for the man who was crippled at the gate, where they they brought healing into his world. They want to keep loving their neighbors. We have got to keep the gospel priority, which means that we've got to take time to stop and observe our own lives and have a moment of self-reflection. And here's a question that we can ask ourselves as we're reflecting to ourselves. Am I seeking to evaluate my politics through the lens of Scripture or create a version of Scripture that supports my politics? Am I seeking to evaluate my politics through the lens of Scripture or am I trying to create a version of Scripture that supports my politics? As a church, we have got to remember our primary purpose is to love God and love our neighbors. This should be what keeps us together. Jesus is the glue that keeps us all together, and this was his purpose. And it's something that we miss sometimes when we look at how Jesus, uh, how he operated. You know that Jesus operated even in tense political spectrums, right? Not only did he operate in that, he welcomed it. Most people miss this, but even in his 12 disciples, he welcomed the left and the right into the 12 disciples. He had Matthew and Simon the Zealot who sat on opposite political spectrums. Matthew the tax collector was likely very pro-government, very big government, very big taxes. Loved Roman rule and loved their taxes because it meant that he was going to have fat pockets. Matthew loved the government. Whatever I got to do to keep them in power, let's make that happen because that's what keeps me wealthy. On the flip side, you had Simon the Zealot, who was believed by many that he was called a zealot because of his political convictions. He was very anti-Roman occupation. He was very anti-big government, very anti-tax, very pro-freedom, and very pro-Israel. So here, even in the 12, Jesus invites the left and the right to a new kingdom. He invites the left and the right to say, let's go do something different. Because if I can't bring you and you together, then there's never going to be a hope for the world. But if you 
Matthew, and you, the zealot, can come together under a new flag, a new kingdom, we can do some new kingdom things. And have one central goal, and that's to go make much of the kingdom of God and to love our neighbors for the sake of the gospel. Church, we absolutely have got to engage the public square because we are Christ's ambassadors. We are representing his kingdom. We are representing his ethic. We are representing his vision. We are representing his platform. And we are called to do so reflecting his image and his character. Understand that his church is not a temporary or his kingdom. It's not a temporary kingdom. It's an eternal kingdom. It's not the kingdom of the elephant or the kingdom of the donkey. It's the kingdom of the lamb. And it's message totally different than any other party's message. It's vision and plan. And even harder to accept perhaps might be this. That its king is far more progressive than most conservatives are probably comfortable admitting. And probably far more conservative than most progressives would like to believe. That's this kingdom. That's the kingdom of God. And Pastor Andy Stanley says it like this. That your candidate will win or lose based on how America votes on a Tuesday in November. But the church will win or lose based on our behavior every day between now and then. Which kingdom are you representing in how you engage the public square, whether it's in person or online? Do your Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, Green, whatever party neighbors, do your neighbors feel loved or belittled by you? Do you think Christ feels represented by you or do you think he's kind of hoping for some new representation? Are your talking points Christ's gospel points? Is your platform priorities? Are they his eternal vision? When you fight to obey God over man, is that also reflected in your personal life? It's just a question. When you have to obey God over man, is that reflected in your private life? It's just a question. Do you spend more time persuading people to a political party or an eternal party that's going to take place one day in heaven when all knees come before, when all people come before the Lord and every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord? Are you spending more time winning people to a political party or that eternal party that's going to take place one day? It's just a question. Is Jesus both your savior and your king? Because church, we're part of a different nation. We're part of a different nation. Kingdoms have risen and kingdoms have fallen, but this kingdom is eternal. This kingdom is eternal. And Peter and John and the other apostles didn't go to jail for a myth. They weren't beaten with an inch of their life for a myth. They didn't rejoice because they were suffering for a myth. They rejoiced because they were counted worthy of the name, is what Acts 5 says. They were counted worthy. They said they actually know that we're with Jesus. That's why they beat us. We're going to rejoice. Let's rejoice with that. I want to be known. If I'm not known for anything else, I want to be known for the fact that the kingdom that I, that I serve with all of my heart is the only kingdom that's going to prevail in eternity. And in the meantime, I'm going to work my best to love my American neighbors with every fiber of my being because God said to love him and to love my neighbor. So I want the best for this country. And I want the best for our neighboring countries. This is our mandate, church. This is a new kingdom ethic, church. This is our platform, church. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you in sincere, I pray with sincerity of heart right now, asking what we're supposed to do. How should we respond with that which we have heard? How should we move with that which we have read? Lord, that this is not just uh, an interesting story or an interesting political uh, story. But God, this is the truth above all truths, that your kingdom is the kingdom above all kingdoms. And one day there's going to be an absolute party in heaven for those that are with you. 
If we're going to get excited about something, Lord, let it be that. Let our hearts be bent towards you. Let our message be bent towards you. Let the words that we share with other people be bent towards you. When we talk about politics, let it not be because we're towing a party line, but because we're trying to represent your gospel values. And we're not trying to take your gospel values and stick them and, and force them into an ideology. But instead, we're trying to evaluate our ideologies and our voting tickets and our policies and the things that we want to see. We're evaluating them by scripture and not turning scripture and manipulating it to fit the ideology. Lord, we're praying for a revival in this nation, but it is not going to happen if your people cannot first put the kingdom of God where it needs to be in their lives. But if we can come together, Father, and we can seek after you, there is no limit to what might happen in this country. If that's truly our prayer. But if our prayer is only to win, then God forgive us. Come alive in us in ways that I don't even know how to ask. Let us re be reborn, Father, with new ideologies and new thoughts and new principles and new hearts that are kingdom-minded and kingdom-founded. Let us become utterly dependent on you. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
announcements. Um, I have just a, a couple of announcements for you. First of all, uh, I want to talk about uh, OCC for just a quick moment. Uh, very different climate that we're living in, COVID and everything else. And so it's been a very odd, odd year for planning a lot of different things. And so um, from what I understand, I'm still trying to get the details together. We do have spots reserved for the OCC trip, but it's not going to be Boone. We were not able to secure spots in Boone. The spots that were reserved for that trip, from what I understand, were in Baltimore. And so, <laughs> little different. <laughs> Baltimore. The mountains. <laughs> but the, mountains. <laughs> the mission is still the same. And the gospel is still the same. Okay, but what we're needing, if we're going to go on this trip, it needs a trip coordinator. We have the spots, but we need a coordinator. So if you're interested in going on the trip, uh, we're going to probably need somebody to coordinate. I would say probably at the latest to at least let me know by next Sunday. Uh, because otherwise, we're going to have to just go ahead and release the spot so other people might have the opportunity to go. And so if you're interested in coordinating that trip, let me know. Uh, also, shoe boxes. Uh, we typically uh, pack some shoe boxes here at the church, but there's two ways we do shoe boxes. One, we pack some here at the church. Uh, we're going to do less this year this way because we're also hoping people are going to start packing some individual boxes as well. Right? It's going to be a both end. The goal is to still, we want to send as many kids presents and the gospel across the globe. But if you'd like to give to uh, giving shoe boxes, you can go online and give. There's a, there's a line item there. Or you can give in person and just mark shoe boxes and it'll go toward the shipping of the shoe boxes that we pack here at the church. So those are the announcements. The, uh, the only other, uh, one more announcement is next week I am going to be out of town. Uh, I am going to see my babies. I'm going to see McKenna and Connor for the first time since I dropped them off at College of Laura and I. And uh, so we're going to be heading up there. I cannot wait. It is going to be a weird visit because you can't go watch football because you can't go into the stadium. There's a whole lot of things that are happening. But, you know, the only thing I need is I need a hug from McKenna and I need a hug from Connor. If I can get those two things, that's all I need. So I'm going to be gone next week. I'll leave Thursday, taking a couple days off. Laura and I, we're going to be back Sunday night sometime. Pray for safety for us, if you will. Uh, and also, uh, we're just going to have a great time. But Pastor Jason will be preaching. He's going to continue the book of Acts. He's going to skip ahead for me because I'd like to preach on uh, Acts 6. So he's going to preach Acts 7 next week. And I'm going to come back to 6 when I get back. So those are the announcements. That's what's happening here at Bethany. We're glad that you all were here this morning. Uh, may God bless you as you go. Remember, listen, the ministry is just starting. We're here. Now it's time to take it. Whatever happens here has to go there. So uh, let's close in prayer. And I'm going to ask... Uh, Brother Chuck, would you mind closing us a prayer, sir? Dear yeah, Father, thank you for this wonderful day, Lord, and the word we heard, Lord, the spirit of your word, Lord. Let us live by it, Lord, and I, I'm so grateful, Lord, to be here and here. And our Lord, I'm grateful to live in a nation that we are free to be here, Lord. Mm -hmm. And our Lord, I'm just, I, I'm so um, also thankful for every person here, Lord. I'm thankful for my church family, Lord, that we love each other, we care for each other, we pray for each other, and our Lord just. Uh, Continue to be with our, uh, all our students that's in college, Lord. It's, uh, this virus is, uh, it looks like it's getting a little worse, but uh, not as bad as um, it was as far as uh, the critical part of it. But Lord, for all the people that's uh, suffering with this, Lord, we just pray for the families, Lord. As we think about them, Lord, just lift them up every day. The ones that's uh, left behind, that we'll one day we'll have this disease cured, Lord, by your blood on the cross. And we'll all be together one day in heaven, Lord, the ones that have faith and belief. We won't have to worry about no more pain and sorrow, mm -hmm. Lord. It's a wonderful day coming mm -hmm. that we'll never leave no more. And we'll always be protected by your blood. In your holy blessed name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Amen.